Starship's making Moonbase Alpha affordable with full reusability and record low launch costs. Construction phase? Solved. But once large-scale lunar mining begins, rocket fuel becomes your biggest financial nightmare. Each launch needs propellant, refueling, repeated trips, costs skyrocket fast. So how do you move materials without burning profits? Musk's answer, a solar-powered electromagnetic rail from the 1970s. This mass driver can launch 600,000 tons per year using pure solar energy, zero rocket fuel needed. Could this forgotten tech actually solve the moon mining fuel crisis? Let's dive right in. Here's the reality. On Earth, we're fighting 1G of gravity and thick atmosphere. Rockets are our only option, blasting superheated gas downward to push massive payloads up. Starship handles this brilliantly with full reusability. But the moon? Completely different game. Gravity's just one-sixth of Earth's, and there's zero air resistance. Starship needs far less fuel there. Sounds perfect, right? Not when you're running industrial-scale mining operations. You're not launching once or twice. You're moving hundreds of thousands of tons annually. Every single launch still requires propellant. Starship lands, refuels, launches again. Repeat that cycle thousands of times, and suddenly your cheap moon base becomes a logistics nightmare bleeding money on fuel costs alone. What's the point of mining lunar resources if you're spending more on fuel than the materials are worth? This is exactly where Musk's thinking diverges from traditional space planners. Back in the 1970s and 80s, scientists proposed something radical, the mass driver. Think of it as an electric catapult, a long electromagnetic track that uses magnetic forces to accelerate payloads to orbital velocity. No combustion, no propellant, just pure electromagnetic acceleration powered by solar energy. The physics are straightforward. Payloads sit on magnetic levitation pods that float above the track. No friction, no contact. Electromagnets fire in sequence, pulling the pod forward while pushing from behind, building speed progressively until it hits 1.7 kilometers per second. Fast enough to reach lunar orbit. At peak velocity, the pod releases its cargo and shoots into space. Here's what makes this game changing. Once built, a mass driver can launch up to 600,000 tons of material per year, continuously, cheaply. No rocket equations to worry about. No diminishing returns from carrying propellant weight. The most promising concept is the lunar circular mass driver, built inside a crater where natural walls provide structural support. The cargo pod loops around this circular track repeatedly, accelerating with each pass. Think of it like a particle accelerator but for mining cargo instead of atoms. Original designs targeted raw materials, iron chunks, steel, refined metals, anything that can handle extreme G-forces during launch. We're talking over 1,000 Gs of acceleration. Brutal for delicate equipment, but perfect for industrial payloads that don't care about rough treatment. But here's where it gets interesting. That same infrastructure could operate in dual modes, crank it to full power, and you're launching cargo at violent speeds. Dial it down to gentle rotation, and you've created an artificial gravity system for astronauts. Spin it slowly around the crater, and riders experience anywhere from half to full Earth gravity, perfect for exercise and long-term health at a lunar base. Same track, completely different applications depending on operational needs. Humans can handle three to five Gs in short bursts. Fighter pilots do it routinely, so a low-power tourist mode becomes totally feasible for base personnel who need regular gravity exposure. Now let's talk about what actually exists versus what's still theoretical. No full-scale lunar mass driver has been built yet, but the concept isn't pure speculation. It's been tested. In 1977, physicist Gerard O'Neill and his team built Mass Driver 1, a 10-meter prototype using superconducting coils to launch a 20-gram payload at 19 meters per second. Small scale, but it proved electromagnetic launch worked. A year later came Mass Driver 2, designed specifically to handle lunar regolith. Both were lab projects funded by NASA grants totaling less than $1 million. Scaling that up for real lunar operations? That's where the numbers get serious. 
A system launching 100,000 tons annually needs constant 8.7 megawatts of power, equivalent to running 5,000 homes nonstop, assuming 84% efficiency. Even small test launches of 3 kilogram payloads at Mach 10 require 30 megawatt bursts. Full industrial versions could demand 1 gigawatt. Early 1980s estimates put construction costs around $24 million for just the physical structure. Add massive energy storage systems, capacitors, power management, and you're looking at billions. Some calculations topped $11 billion. Modern estimates range from $500 million for a basic cargo launcher up to $40 billion for a human-rated, low-gravity version stretching 2,000 kilometers. But here's the critical difference from the 1980s. SpaceX has fundamentally changed launch economics. Starship can deliver construction materials and equipment to the moon cheaper than any previous system in history. What seemed financially impossible 40 years ago is now entering the realm of achievable. Still expensive? Absolutely, but for the first time actually buildable. China's not waiting around. They've announced an $18 billion magnetic launch system specifically designed to extract helium-3, a lunar isotope that some believe could revolutionize Earth's energy through fusion power. Their system, developed by the Shanghai Institute of Satellite Engineering, works like an Olympic hammer thrower, spinning payloads up before releasing them toward Earth. The project ties into China's partnership with Russia to build a lunar research station near the South Pole by 2035. Their pitch is compelling. Just 20 tons of helium-3 could theoretically power all of China for a year. The magnetic launcher would run purely on electricity from solar panels or small nuclear reactors, launching payloads twice daily at one-tenth the cost of traditional rockets. Sounds revolutionary. But Western experts are brutally skeptical and for good reasons. Here's the problem. The fusion reactors needed to actually use helium-3 as fuel don't exist yet. Every experimental fusion device built so far struggles to produce more energy than it consumes. We're decades away from practical fusion power, if it's even achievable with helium-3. Even if fusion technology were ready tomorrow, helium-3 extraction is absurdly impractical. Lunar concentrations are roughly 30 parts per billion, even in optimal locations. To collect just 30 grams of helium-3, you'd need to mine and process one entire ton of lunar soil, assuming perfect efficiency. The actual yield would be far worse. Think about the economics. Scraping and refining mountains of moon dust for microscopic amounts of material. Then building a massive $18 billion magnetic launcher to return those tiny quantities to Earth. The math doesn't work. Several scientists have pointed out that the total helium-3 from any realistic mining operation would be so small you could return it on regular cargo flights. No specialized launch system needed. This raises an important question. Is China's helium-3 focus genuine science or strategic misdirection? A growing number of experts suggest focusing on what the moon actually has in abundance. Metals, aluminum, iron, titanium, Boring materials, but incredibly valuable in low Earth orbit. Mining and refining these on the moon, then launching them to orbital construction sites makes far more economic sense than chasing exotic isotopes. You could build solar arrays, space habitats, spacecraft infrastructure, all from lunar materials launched via mass driver to orbital factories. No need to haul everything up from Earth's deep gravity well. This is where the mass driver concept truly shines. Moving bulk industrial materials cheaply and continuously, the helium-3 narrative might be China's way of justifying massive lunar infrastructure investment, while the real goal is establishing permanent industrial capability and territorial presence. Classic geopolitical strategy. Announce one objective while building toward another. All of this, whether mass drivers, mining operations, or launch systems, requires one critical element massive amounts of power, and that's triggered a new space race. China and Russia announced plans for an automated nuclear power plant on the moon by 2035, designed to power their International Lunar Research Station. The U.S. response was immediate and predictable. If China's targeting 2035, America wants its reactor operational by 2030. Under Artemis, NASA's building a compact 100-kilowatt fission reactor enough to power roughly 100 homes 
or everything a small lunar colony needs for life support, tools, heating, and operations. But why nuclear instead of solar energy that already works on the ISS? The moon's environment is brutal. One lunar day equals two Earth weeks of sunlight, followed by two weeks of complete darkness, with temperatures plunging to negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Solar panels stop working in darkness, and batteries lose efficiency in extreme cold. A fission reactor runs continuously for over a decade, regardless of light conditions, perfect for long-term missions. The logistics are compelling, too. A reactor running for years needs just a few kilograms of enriched uranium-235, barely any space in a starship carrying 100-ton payloads. Using solar panels to power even a small settlement would require kilometers of surface area and thousands of starship trips just hauling equipment. Some have suggested converting entire starships into modular nuclear reactors. Land it, plug it in, instant power. Sounds clever, but the engineering doesn't work. A starship is 9 meters wide, over 50 meters tall when fueled, with an empty mass around 100 to 150 tons. NASA's lunar reactor weighs under 6 tons total and fits in a small cargo bay. Converting a starship wastes over 90% of its structure on empty volume instead of power systems. Worse, starships aren't built for radiation containment. Their thin stainless steel hulls need tons of lead or water shielding. Operating a reactor inside requires massive cooling systems, power cables, and protection from lunar dust and thermal stress. NASA's approach makes far more sense. Compact portable reactors that can be buried underground for safety, deployed immediately upon landing. One starship could deliver multiple six-ton reactor units, each powering different sections as the base expands. Companies like Lockheed and Westinghouse are building units using low-enriched uranium that operate 10 years without maintenance, each producing enough electricity for 70 to 100 homes. But nuclear power isn't just for lunar bases. It's the key to getting humans to Mars faster than ever. NASA and DARPA are developing DRACO, the demonstration rocket for agile cislunar operations, testing nuclear thermal propulsion in orbit. Nuclear thermal rockets superheat hydrogen in a reactor core and blast it out for thrust, achieving twice the efficiency of chemical rockets. That cuts Mars travel time from six to nine months down to three to four months. Less time in space means lower radiation exposure and better crew psychology. After decades of research, nuclear propulsion is finally reaching operational readiness. With steady investment, these systems could be mission-ready within five years, transforming not just how we reach Mars, but how we operate throughout the solar system. The mass driver, nuclear power, and advanced propulsion aren't separate projects. They're interconnected pieces of humanity's permanent expansion beyond Earth. Each technology enables the others, creating an infrastructure network that makes space industry economically viable for the first time in history. So here's what we're really looking at. Starship solves getting to the moon affordably. Nuclear reactors solve power during those brutal two-week lunar nights. But the mass driver? That's what solves the economics of actually staying there and building something permanent. Moving 600,000 tons of material annually without burning rocket fuel. That's not just cost savings. That's the difference between a research outpost and an actual industrial civilization. The electromagnetic launch track transforms the moon from a destination into a manufacturing hub, where metals mined from craters get launched to orbital construction sites building the next generation of space infrastructure. And it's all connected. Nuclear reactors power the mass driver. Mass drivers make mining profitable. Mining operations justify the reactors. Nuclear propulsion cuts Mars transit time in half. Each piece enables the others. China sees this clearly. Whether their helium-3 focus is genuine or strategic theater, they're building permanent infrastructure. Russia's leveraging Soviet-era reactor experience. The U.S. is racing to deploy by 2030. This isn't just about the moon anymore. It's about who controls the industrial foundation for everything that comes after. Mars bases, asteroid mining, orbital manufacturing. The technology Musk's betting on isn't new. It's from the 1970s. What's new is that for the first time in history, we can actually afford to build it. What do you think? Will mass drivers become reality within the next decade? Or will fuel costs kill large-scale moon mining before we get there?
Drop your thoughts below. If this breakdown gave you a new perspective on lunar economics and the real engineering behind Moonbase Alpha, hit that like button and subscribe to Space Update 24 hours for more deep dives into what's actually happening in space development. Share this with anyone still thinking moon mining is just science fiction, the math is real, and it's happening faster than most people realize.